and I'm gonna introduce both of them first. The first one is coming from Australia. He is connecting all the way from from around the world, and he is the Professor Daryl Higgins, Director of the Institute of Child Protection Studies at the Australian Catholic University. And he's going to be talking today about the SDGs and preventing violence against children. And the second speaker in this section will be Dr. Chimba Ragavan. She is now the Active Chief of Early Childhood Development at UNICEF. And she will be inspiring us about early childhood development and parenting, uh, responding to the crisis of care and learning. So for now, I'll, I'll give the floor to Professor Higgins. You have the floor. Thank you, Alex. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, yes. great. Um, so it's a real pleasure to be here. And I was uh, part of a team uh, that uh, was working on a, a piece of research to try and explore um, the ways in which family policies are critical for supporting um, achievement of the, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, um, and how it is that we can um, also use the SDGs to promote um, family development. Um, my interest in this area um, is as a, a psychologist and a researcher looking at um, uh, many elements of child development, but in particular violence prevention. Um, so I've had a, a long focus around prevention of all forms of harm to children, uh, but particularly abuse and neglect from parents, and also uh, sexual abuse within youth serving organisations. Um, uh, but always taking a, a prevention and Angle. And so uh, when IFFD coordinated a group of international uh, researchers to come together and look at what the, um, the data says uh, globally um, around a number of different family indicators that related to the issue of family functioning um, and family related policies, um, I was delighted to be on, poor, on board. So today I'm going to be talking about the chapter that I contributed uh, primarily to um, in that piece of work, and that relates to the issues of families. So um, the, the most significant one that um, is focused on the issue of uh, ending violence is SDG 16. But there's also a number of other targets around SDG 3 and SDG 4 that are, that are relevant. And so I'm going to not talk about them individually, but talk about them together and think about how, as a, as a global community, we can be trying to do better for children, but also for adults in terms of ending violence. My personal expertise is more in children, so pardon me if I give more of my examples um, from that. So uh, I, I've been working in the field of child abuse and neglect prevention for about uh, 25 years now. So um, I'll be talking um, a little bit about my context here in Australia and happy to answer questions if we have some time at the end um, around that. So I'm um, going through the, the reason why um, we've kind of taken a family's angle in this piece of research is, um, is kind of, it's a little bit ironic in some ways because families in relation to violence towards children and in fact violence towards women, um, families can be the very site of or the location for that harm, for that abuse, for that violence. But they can also be the site for intervention, the site for prevention, and the site for um, restoring positive relationships. Um, and so it's a, it's a complex area to be talking about families when you're talking about them in both negative and in positive ways. But it does really show that we need to then be bringing on board from a, um, a public policy perspective a perspective around the role of families. And I've also written about some of the challenges there because of course, um, families in, in many countries, the, the role of family life is seen as being very private and very sacred and something that governments shouldn't be involved in. Families should be just be allowed to get on with doing what they do and public policy should be um, around other things. And so I would really call into question that kind of policy because we know that children's development is very much aligned to 
what goes on within families. And we know about what makes for positive parenting. We know what makes for um, a violence-free childhood and what promotes positive development. And so if we fail to, um, to be clear about that and to have policies and supports that align with that, then we really miss an important um, opportunity. And I'll talk a little bit more around some of the avenues and opportunities for getting those supports in. But I want to give a very brief overview of um, some of the, uh, uh, the findings that we had. So one of the points that we make in, the, in, the, in, in this uh, chapter um, is I focus on the issue of the intersection between different forms of violence, both in terms of some of the theories, if you like, around what causes violence, but also in terms of the actual experience. And, and um, this comes from some of my areas of, of research. When I was first starting to um, uh, work in this space, I was looking at the intersections, the overlap in children's experiences of five different forms of child maltreatment. So physical abuse, sexual abuse, psychological abuse, neglect and exposure to family violence. And what um, I found was that they were highly interrelated, highly correlated. So the chances were if you'd experienced one of those forms that you would also have experienced a second or possibly even a third or a fourth or a fifth. What I also found was that the um, kind of negative impacts of those different forms of violence would tend to accumulate over time. Um, and so that's both um, a challenge for us that uh, these, these types of violence, because they go on in families, um, are, are likely to mean that children are exposed not only on multiple occasions, but to multiple types of harm. So they might be living in a family that is neglectful, but also exposes them to child sexual abuse, etc. So um, that's a challenge, but it also means that there's some synergies, there's some um, overlaps in terms of how we might want to intervene. Because of course, one of the critical ingredients in, in the issue of family life is the knowledge and the skill and the capability of parents to provide safe and nurturing environments for their children. So building the capacity of parents, we could call that parenting skills through parenting programs, is likely to have positive impacts, not just on one type of violence prevention, such as preventing corporal punishment or preventing physical abuse through the choice of discipline styles that a, a, a parent may have, but in fact, will have much broader impacts on a range of uh, 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 violence um, types. So in terms of the, um, uh, the, the issue of conceptualization, if you like, of how violence occurs. I think we're at a different stage of, of um, uh, kind of theoretical development. Um, and I've certainly been impressed in Australia with some of the work that's been done in the violence against women space to try and understand um, the risk factors and to put that together in quite a sophisticated package where it's understood that while there might be some immediate kind of risk factors, that there's a whole lot of um, drivers, if you like, or what we might call determinants of family life. <clears throat> and they go to things like um, gender inequity. So the um, patriarchal nature of society, the lack of access to, um, uh, to meaningful work and to equality in pay and to equality before the law, that is a fairly fundamental issue that then leads to a number of these other things, such as a sense of entitlement within relationships that men may demonstrate. Um, and so it, it kind of understands these um, risk factors, if you like, at different levels, at the individual factor, but more importantly, at the societal level. And I think we can apply some of that thinking um, that's already been worked through in some of these other areas of violence prevention to the areas of child abuse and neglect. And so I'm, I'm kind of I'm very interested in working in that space to try and do better, if you like, for understanding the theory, if you like, behind it. One of the tasks that we took with this piece of work for the SDGs was, first of all, to look at, well, what is the data around some of these um, different types of violence. And uh, I, I, I'm not gonna go into too much detail because it's quite data heavy and please have a look at the link that uh, the organizers will have provided uh, for you. But I think um, there's, there's a few different messages that come out for me. One is 
Um, there's a, a lack of data across a number of the different violence types. So if we're really genuine about meeting the SDGs, at a country level, at a, at, a, at a state level, we actually need to do better at counting what it is that we are interested in, uh, try, the problem that we're trying to solve. Otherwise, we won't know whether we are improving and we won't have benchmarks against which to kind of map our improvement processes. The second point I'd make is that the, um, the, the strength of data that we have is not necessarily in the places that we would assume. So it's not necessarily, you know, white Anglo-Saxon democracies where there's this fantastic data and the rest of the world is, is way behind. That is not the way it was. And certainly as, as an Australian, I'd like to think, you know, Australia is doing really well in this space. We're not. We don't have good data collection on a number of the different types of violence, um, uh, especially within families that, uh, that, that we need. And so I'm actively working on some research here in Australia to try and address that problem now. But the converse in terms of research around what works to try and um, address uh, and overcome violence is a bit of a flip. And of course, I'm speaking as, a, as an a native English speaker, and so I'm only looking at research in the English language because that's I, I don't speak any other languages. So I was not able to look at um, at at at, uh, at the research literature that may be published in um, in in non English um, in other languages. So that's a that's an important caveat. But in terms of English. A lot of the um, uh, the data does come from um, the kind of you know Anglo um, democracies, if you like. Um, so in in places like um, the UK um, and Australia, Canada, New Zealand, uh, North America generally, the US uh, and, and Canada, um, that's the places where a lot of the research comes from. So it's interesting that those are the places that have gone to the bother of developing interventions and measuring and monitoring them but they don't have as good systems in many of those countries at actually monitoring the problem they're trying to solve. So it's, a, it's an interesting um, uh, 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 paradox, if you like, as to where the focus has been. So I want to turn in the final few minutes that I have um, to talking about what some of those solutions are. So what does, what does the evidence say? And I'll focus in particular around children. And of course, the, um, the particular focus on the, the research literature is around the value of parenting programs. And from a, um, a kind of a, a development perspective, what we know is that supporting parents is the best way of supporting children's positive development. Um, and we know that there are a number of kind of effective prevention strategies um, that do address violence against children um, and other forms of harm. And when I say violence, you know, I'm including uh, uh, emotional violence, I'm including neglect of their physical well-being, as well as, of course, physical and sexual violence. So um, there's a lot of research showing the effectiveness of um, those kind of parenting um, interventions. Some of them have been done at, uh, in, a, in a wide scale way. Other have, others have been done in more narrow kind of piloted sense. Some of them have been, you know, whole of community. So a whole county or, you know, geographic area where a particular intervention has been rolled out. Um, the second kind of group of interventions um, as well as family or, or parenting skills interventions is really around trying to address um, violence against women through changing um, attitudes and uh, through supporting um, kind of gender equity strategies. Then there's a group of programs that are around schools and intervening in schools in order to address violence. And that's kind of targeted at um, a few different levels. So it's targeting uh, kind of peer bullying and peer violence within schools. Also about um, early prevention of dating violence, because we know that particularly in the kind of um, latter part of schooling and, you know, university type age, that that is a really significant problem in many countries. And so being able to address early on the negative stereotypes and attitudes and sense of entitlement that males in particular um, are likely to be forming at that stage is um, really, really important. And so there've been a number of different programs that have been shown to be effective in school contexts. 
And then there's another set of um, interventions that we, uh, what we might call kind of community-based interventions. Um, and they can sometimes be a combination of, of these other um, individual oriented um, programs. So ones that are addressing families, ones that might be addressing schools and so forth, but are coordinated up and are trying to change the social norms, to change the attitudes and the expectations and to lift up all of the, um, uh, the community in terms of improved attitudes towards women, towards children and knowledge around what are um, supportive and positive, um, creating positive environments for, uh, for children and for families. Um, and so there's, there's uh, a few different types of programs that have been shown. And there's probably more in that space that, uh, that have been um, developed in, um, uh, in Africa as well as in North America. So um, I, I, th I think it's time for me to wrap up now, um, but I just wanted to make one final point, and that is the issue of how we deliver some of these programs is really important. And I've become quite passionate about what's known as the public health approach to prevention. And that really emphasises the need for, rather than working out who are the um, problem families or the problem individuals and trying to remediate you know, the high risk groups, it says that our strategies really need to be targeted at a whole of community, a whole of society, and using non-stigmatising methods, particularly building on those platforms where families are already engaging. So that means schools, it means health services, um, it means uh, those places where families are already going. So it might be a recognised community hub so that it's not um, difficult for parents to be able to reach out and get support, or even better, for them to not really realise that, that they, in fact, are um, having an intervention or a program delivered to them, that it's more casual, that it is more um, integrated within the service delivery model of, you know, the early childhood centre or the school or the community hub, that it's being modelled what good parenting is. And the idea of, you know, being tutored and supported and helped um, is just an integral part of society. Um, and so I've sent through some links uh, with some further documentation around what a public health approach is like. I think my 15 minutes is probably up, Alex. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak on this uh, really uh, important topic to me. Thank you, Ariel. I mean, it's, it's always a pleasure to hear you. And I'm more, I mean, I, I really want to appreciate your commitment with the event because it's, I know that is really late in Australia. Even yes, it's nearly really, bedtime, but that's okay. I'm happy to be here. And it's, even though it's really early here in, in, in the other side of the world, but I really appreciate that. And also you mentioned of, of parenting and, and how it can be a model. That's kind of the, the key word there. And I want to give, um, I want to leave the questions to the end um, to, to make them available for both, uh, Dr. Ragavan and yourself. Now I just wanna give the floor to Dr. Ragavan. She also comes, um, well, she's actually here in New York these days, <laughs> but um, she's been now the active chief of early childhood development at UNICEF. And it's she has a tough job now to to wear two hats. She's also uh, been really, really helpful for us at the UN uh, with many, in many ways for the, with the initiative of UNICEF, family friendly policies. So I just wanna give uh, her the, the floor now. Thank you everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, good yes. morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, I just, uh, you know, want to thank uh, IFFD and uh, all the participants here today. Uh, wow, 89 people uh, from different time zones. Big shout out. Thank you so much for being here and for listening to us. Um, I wanted to introduce my colleague, Erica Wong, who will actually be supporting the beaming of the slides here. Uh, and, uh, you know, thank you so much. So I wanted to start with uh, saying that my presentation today is, to, uh, uh, you know, hopefully we'll do two things. One is um, build on what the Secretary General has already said in the opening, which is looking at evidence and seeing how we build on that evidence and go forward. 
and Dr. Daryl Higgins, who spoke just now, uh, who talked about uh, you know uh, some very key aspects from that evidence. Um, so, you know, how, how is, uh, you know, and we are going to build on that presentation, so we build on those presentations and highlight one particular area, parenting, that, that they have both referred to in their conversations today. The second thing I'm hoping to do is to show you what has already begun around the globe uh, in what we see as a response uh, in the context of uh, COVID-19. Uh, where we have identified what we call a crisis of care and learning. So this is where, um, you know, I'm, I'm uh, you know, drawing from uh, our work and uh, showing you, uh, you know, how we are responding to the crisis of care and learning and how we can come together as an international community to advocate for, uh, you know, the support that parents and caregivers. So the current situation that we are in is likely to have a very far reaching and long term impact on several SDGs. I want to highlight particularly SDG 4.2, which is, uh, you know, the target for early childhood development. And under that, we have two indicators. One, children under five years of age who are developmentally on track in health learning and psychosocial well-being. Why did we have these three things? All of these together, in addition to nutrition, stimulation, protection, uh, early learning, responsive caregiving, all of these together constitute what we need for a child to develop holistically. And we now have an indicator that can measure and track and assess this progress. So given this, you know, we think that the current situation, just looking at the numbers that we have, uh, are likely to be uh, quite long lasting. Um, so for example, uh, you know, we know that, uh, we knew for a long time now that um, really about 43% uh, uh, of children under five years of age in low and middle income countries, that is approximately 250 million children were already at risk of not achieving their potential due to poverty, poor, poor health, nutrition, and lack of early stimulation. Now, this has been particularly exacerbated in the COVID context. We have had 188 countries and counting imposing countrywide school closures, close to 1.8 billion learners continuing to be affected due to COVID-19 related closures. At least 40 million children worldwide missing on early childhood education in their critical preschool years. About 42 to 66 million children falling into extreme poverty as a result of the crisis, adding to the estimated 366 million children already in extreme poverty in 2019. And as Professor Higgins has already pointed out, several children, and I think our estimates are putting it at around 300 million aged two to four year olds, regularly experiencing violent discipline in the hands of their caregivers. Now imagine the situation in a lockdown, you know, with children. Uh, and families being in a lockdown and the stress of not having jobs, of having poverty, you know, these are all now exacerbated and we think has led to a long-term crisis of care and learning. Interruption of ECD services and increased stress due to health concerns, job insecurity, lockdowns, et cetera, will now negatively affect the ability of parents and caregivers to provide that nurturing care that is so important to prevent that violence and to promote positive early childhood development. Next slide, please. Now, we've been talking about parenting. We are now trying to unpack what exactly we mean by parenting. We have uh, in and UNICEF have agreed to you know, sort of operation and not get hung up on, you know, necessarily terminology and let that prevent our work from going forward, but to have sort of a common, you know, sort of language and an understanding uh, of what we mean by that. Operationally, we are now defining that this includes interactions, behaviors, emotions, knowledge, beliefs, attitudes, and practices that are associated with the provision of that nurturing care for a child and not just a young child, but a child up to the age of 18 as is defined by the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Now, who is a caregiver? A caregiver does not necessarily have to be just a parent, but a person who is very closely attached to the child responsible for their daily care and support. So primary caregivers can include parents, of course, families, and other people who are directly responsible for the children at home. 
I grew up in Asia, worked in Asia quite a bit, and I know that grandparents, for example, have a very critical role in being caregivers for these children, particularly true in migrant populations that are moving around and have and rely on family support. Now, now imagine again in COVID that these have been impacted, that the elderly care that was available to pair with the younger children is no longer available. So these also include carers outside the home, such as people working in organized childcare centers, et cetera. Now, parenting programs provide support for this caregiving function. So a set of activities or services aimed at improving how parents approach and execute their role as parents across the child's life cycle, specifically on their attitudes, knowledge, skills, behaviors, and practices. So that's the sort of relatively boring stuff out of the way, just so we have a common understanding of what we mean by that. If we go to the next slide, please. That's the what. Now, why? Why do we enhance parenting support now? You know, why now? If we look at this image, uh, this is, you know, a child's brain. And it has, you know, these centers that are, are sort of uh, sitting in the child's head. If we can imagine this as, you know, health and nutrition, then there's another area of the brain. And, you know, forgive me, I've forgotten a lot of my high school biology. But, uh, you know, there are centers in the brain that deal with cognitive functions. There are centers in the brain that deal with your social emotional functions. There are centers in the brain that have to do with the child's feeling of being secure and safe and being able to develop optimally. What the science is telling us now is that any impact to one area of the brain is concurrently causing a lot of uh, impacts in the other areas of brain. So it's not, you know, it's not just structural, but functionally, uh, you know, that uh, there could be impacts, which means that we cannot sit and say, let us first take care of the child's education and then we can worry about the safety or let us first take care of the child's safety and then you know, let's first feed the child and then worry about the brain. These things have to happen together, particularly in the COVID era now, this is very, uh, very important to remember. And remember also that the microsystem of a child and the child's life is that immediate environment that the child is surrounded by, the parents and the caregivers and the families. Now, how do we empower them? How do we support them so that the other systems, the meso system, the exo system, the macro system, you know, those things, how do they then come in and help the child? The immediate circle surrounding the child, that parent, that caregiving support has to be operationally supported. I already see a question in the chat box in practical terms, how are we working on this? And that's exactly what I'm going to come to next on the next slide, please. The how, and thank you for the question. I think it's from Ryan. In practical terms, how is UNICEF working together to implement these programs? How do we implement these policy recommendations? So what UNICEF is doing is really, we've identified five approaches to parenting support. Uh, and this, these vary by levels. So at the level at which we are coming in, the domains we're looking at to ensure that all domains are indeed uh, working together and the ages, right? So when we're talking about parenting, we're talking about levels, ages, and domains. Let's just keep that in the back of our minds. And the way we have conceptualized, and within UNICEF, you know, we have teams that are from health, from nutrition, from uh, hygiene, wash, uh, social policy, early childhood development, adolescent development, gender, uh, you know, communication for development, division of communication and uh, division of partnerships. We're all coming together to define a strategy which really looks at five approaches. One is we have to strengthen enabling environments for parents. So it's not just about asking a parent to do this or that, but really having uh, the, the environments that support them to do so. I'll talk about this in a minute. The second one is supporting strengthened workforce capacities and integrated services. The third is through raising levels of awareness. The fourth is through prom promising, uh, promoting positive gender norms and socialization. And the fifth is really empowering parents and communities and bringing them along as partners rather than as targets of information. Next slide, please. The first one, strengthening enabling environments. From the early childhood development lens, we are really working on several areas. The first is 
public finance, to call for public financing of several programs for early childhood development is very critical. Uh, you know, the, the point was made that, you know, sometimes we think of family as a private space not to be touched. But if we think about it, these are the, these are the most uh, frontline responders right now. Parents are the frontline responders in the COVID era. So how do we support them? One way is to ensure this, this uh, you know, that public financing is available uh, for children. Uh, the second is through family-friendly policies. I think Alex mentioned this when he introduced me. This is an initiative that we have started uh, about two years ago, and it's rapidly gaining ground. It initially asked for four asks. One is paid parental leave available to both parents. Breastfeeding support. So while putting breastfeeding infrastructure is very important, having that support throughout to help implement that more effectively, such as non-discrimination, breastfeeding breaks, uh, you know, support with uh, facilities, et cetera, is really important. The third is quality, accessible, affordable childcare. Nowhere is that more important than the present times. And the last is child benefits. So these were the four initial asks of the family friendly policies environment. We are now working to see what else needs to be tweaked. So flexible work needs to be tweaked now. Already we are learning that from our partners and our work during COVID. Uh, informal sector workers and how we support them. That needs to be uh, very clearly articulated. So we've started our work on that. And thirdly, families in fragile contexts and how we support them should be more articulated. So those are the specific ways, Ryan, in answer to your question, that we are working on the strengthening and enabling environments. Next slide, please. On the second area that we are working on, which is supporting strengthened workforce capacities and integrated services. So uh, on this one, I think uh, I'm also going to try and address the question as it is coming up. Uh, it's on how do we address this culturally? We have a global framework called the Nurturing Care Framework that has been endorsed by the WHO, the bank, and uh, I mean, that has been co-initiated uh, by the WHO, UNICEF, and the World Bank, and is gaining support rapidly around the globe with communities. Now, this is a framework that has to be culturally sensitive, but also ensure that the child has the right to receive five key elements as the child develops. Good health, adequate nutrition, security and safety, opportunities for early learning and responsive caregiving. So all of these have to come together, both through systems as well as through parenting support, very clearly. So we're really working on this in the COVID context. We are really working on ECD kits for emergencies that are you know, sort of rapidly deployable kits that, uh, that we've been using for a while. We have a package called the Care for Child Development Package that involves uh, key messages on stimulation and responsive care that are practically include, included in frontline worker training. Next slide, please. Uh, and that uh, the third area, so we have, uh, you know, the COVID uh, early childhood development and parenting response and recovery toolkit that we've been working on, you know, and that should be available soon. The next slide, please. Uh, raising levels of awareness. We have a parenting hub in the UNICEF website, which is, uh, you know, a big go-to website for many communities around the world. We've had a lot of traffic in this uh, website. It compiles all the resources that we have on, on COVID, on parenting, etc. cetera. Uh, next slide, please. We also have, for low resource contexts that don't always have internet access, mobile-based uh, uh, technologies, for example, and other sort of technologies where we use things like WhatsApp groups to support parenting. Uh, this is called uh, the Internet of Good Things. And this is a platform also that uh, has worked in many countries to, to, to give the resources to parents in low resource contexts. Next slide, please. Uh, I'm promoting positive gender norms and socialization. I think father's engagement was mentioned in the opening remarks. Uh, this is something that we are also very uh, keen to work with. We are working with many countries to highlight the importance of father's engagement in this process. 
We believe that in the COVID context, this may be an opportunity. I also referred to, uh, for example, traditional childcare structures breaking down, childcare centers being closed, grandparents no longer being available because of the risk of the infection, et cetera. In these cases, how can we put our heads together to raise awareness of the importance of the father's role uh, in the family uh, and the parenting uh, space? Next slide, please. And the last and the last but not the least is the empowering parents and communities. It's not just about giving information to parents. It's about learning from them as well. It's a bi-directional process. Parents come with a great deal of experience. They are experts as well. But um, there's also a very important uh, element here, which is mental health of the caregivers themselves. So in order to address all of that, again, we have a package that is in development called Caring for Caregivers. Uh, so we are now in the process of expanding our countries that are receiving this package, etc. I know we're running out of time, so I'm going to go to the last slide very soon. Uh, how can we all support? How can we bring all of this work together? Um, we can advocate to, promote, to protect and enhance public investment in parenting support programs as a community. Second, we can provide continued emphasis and elevate the importance of parenting services and interventions, especially for the early years and especially in the pandemic and its aftermath, whenever that comes. The third is enhance direct support to parents with tools and tips, uh, promoting the mental health of uh, caregivers as well and not just the children. And lastly, empowering parents, policymakers and key stakeholders with the latest evidence on parenting practices, child well-being and their own mental health. Thank you. Thank you, Chamba. It's always a pleasure to hear. I mean, um, we've been really close to this uh, initiative and we've been part of many workshops organized by UNICEF and UNICEF House. And it's, it's really interesting. I mean, as you said, let's, let's keep on working instead of just letting the definition stop us and all the programs. So with this family friendly policies, I open the floor to, to all the questions that, are, that have been submitted to the speakers. I have here the first, I mean, you, you already asked, uh, answered one, uh, Chemba, so thank you for that. And this is one for Daryl. Uh, I'm gonna read it out loud, and also I'm gonna share with, with Daryl all, uh, as well for him to answer. Culturally, we all participate in different places. According to the SDG, the global partnership has always been an important part of making a strong impact. How ethical is it for you, for the state or non-governmental organizations to intervene in responses to child violence and family structure? There. Yeah, thanks Alex. I'd, I'd actually turn the question around the other way and saying, you know, is it ethical to not respond? Yeah. You know, I think we have an obligation, whether it's state actors, whether it's civil society, you know, through non-government organisations, when we see children in need and we have the evidence to know that providing support to their families and we fail to take that opportunity, I think we are letting down children across the globe. Um, but I also think because we are often doing this in different places and in, and, um, in our own kind of culturally um, appropriate ways, that can, be, that can be good because it means we're close to our culture and we know what's gonna work. But I think there's also opportunities for learning um, from what might be tried in a really different place and trying to understand what we can think about, you know, in our own country from what might be going on elsewhere. So I really love the, you know, what, what you're, you're doing here uh, today um, because it is about sharing ideas from around the globe to help meet um, the, uh, the best development outcomes for children. Thank you, Darren. Um, I'm going to pose the next question is how, can, how we can strengthen the public narrative to promote family policies oriented to childcare. I'm going to, if you, if you don't mind, I'm going to give the floor to Chemba first, and then you can. No, thank you. I think, I think we, we, you know, first of all, I think the, the sort of the belief that somehow childcare is a private responsibility of parents. I think um, addressing that is really key. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of evidence around uh, quality childcare improving 
children's developmental outcomes. So one advocacy entry point may be uh, the positive benefits of childcare and highlighting uh, you know, how quality childcare can improve uh, the family situation overall, you know, so sort of linking it to uh, women's employability, the potential for income increase in the family, uh, the potential for, uh, you know, I mean, I think every, I think every parent wants the best for their child. If we operate on that assumption, then um, we, we really start building on, uh, you know, that piece and show that quality childcare can promote school outcomes, for example can promote health outcomes. I think, I think it's these pieces that we need to bring together as a first step. A second step would be to advocate for public investments. Mm. Um, and that's, that's really, really important. A third space that we are working on through the Family Friendly Policies Initiative, some of our learnings have been that getting the private sector uh, to be aware of, of uh, you know, the importance of childcare would be very, very important. So, uh, so to look at business engagement uh, as another entry point. So those would be my three. Thank you, Chandra. And congratulations again for that initiative. Uh, Daryl, do you have anything to say? Yeah, about look, I, I, I totally agree with that. Um, I, I think one of the um, really interesting piece of research that um, has actually been carried out here in Australia, but led by um, the Frameworks Institute from the US, is talking about how um, when, when um, making the public narrative, if you like, around families and child wellbeing, um, how it is that you can garner positive support from people. And what they did was, is they actually tried out a number of different frames. And they used this, this concept of a frame, meaning you can be talking about things in a whole heap of different ways, um, but how you frame it, um, the language that you use and the kind of orientation that you put around the concept that you're talking about will change the receptivity of, of the person. And in fact, they did some experimental testing talking about exactly the same kind of policy or strategy, but using different frames and then asking a whole lot of questions um, around what kind of supports um, uh, the individuals might have for, for a whole range of different you know, policies, including investment in schools and so forth. And by framing this discussion, in a child development oriented way, increased the level of acceptance and support, you know, and, and acceptability of increasing taxation in order to be able to support this kind of stuff. Very, very clear results. So what they produced was a, a, a kind of a, a kit or a guide for the frame that we can put around parenting. And it starts with the concept of child development. So putting that at the center, and then using a metaphor that helps build that sense um, of what it is that we're trying to do. And so rather than framing parenting as problematic and hard and difficult and a skill that has to be learned, which is, you know, what I was yeah. guilty of doing. I talked about parenting as a skill that has to be learned. Um, they talk about, you know, concepts such as um, na uh, the, the metaphor of navigation and the lighthouse and being able to guide and support. But you talk first about helping children grow and thrive and develop. And you start the conversation there before you then talk about those interventions that you want to build the policy support around. So I'll, I'll put some links in um, the chat function to that research. Okay, thank you so much. I have here another, another question that is kind of more like narrowed down to, to what we were talking. It's how COVID-19 has led to teenage pregnancies and soon they will be parents. How are we prepared to assist them in parenting since they are children, having children? Chimba, can you start with this? Please? Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. No, it's, this is a very key issue. And, you know, and I think it's, uh, it's something that we've also been aware of. <coughs> so the, the package that I mentioned, caring for the caregiver, actually, um, you know, uh, we, we started with the idea of uh, helping um, adolescent uh, parents, right? So, so it's, 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 that has a big component to it. Um, one of the key elements that we have to focus on in the adolescent pregnancy space is, uh, you know, uh, the enabling environment. Do we have plans that articulate that support? Do we have action items that actually explicitly identify uh, pathways for these children having children? Because they are, uh, you know, there are 
two children involved in this process, uh, and frequently a third. You know, sometimes the father is also an adolescent. So, how do we how do we put the supports in place in that enabling environment space? So. Uh, some some concrete actions are, you know, modifying existing policies to more explicitly articulate uh, this particular idea. To have action plans, resource, budget, and identify these populations as as very important to support. That's in the enabling environment space. In the service space, do we have, for example, health workers that are reaching families that are reaching these adolescent parents for their healthcare needs? Can they also take messages around parenting? and stimulation and, uh, you know, children's development, you know, to build on Daryl's point of, uh, you know, uh, let's not make this a punishment. It's not, parenting is not, mm. uh, you know, it's something that for centuries families have done, you know, it's like, and, and you know, uh, I have had a fora where people have asked me, what is it you are telling me that my grandmother hasn't done? Right? <laughs> so I think it is, it is a very important question and we really have to show what is in the evidence that shows what grandma did right also and build on that but not all indigenous practices are necessarily relevant mm -hmm. or viable or uh, or uh, uh, harmless uh, at this point so we have to sort of examine the evidence in the countries that we work in and look at that so i would say build the enabling environment for the adolescent pregnant adolescents build the services that they need, make sure that these are explicitly articulated, and third, raise awareness around the stigma hmm. uh, and, and work with that. Okay, thank you, Chima. Yeah, Daryl? Uh, I don't know that I have anything to add to that. Um, I think that's <laughs> a very comprehensive answer. Uh, I'm, I'm just pointing out to, to the person who was asking the question about um, what are the evidence-based programs, that we do have some lists at the end of the chapter seven. Um, uh, yeah. So if you can have a look at there. Yeah. Exactly, yeah, okay. So actually jumping on, the, now that Timba just mentioned uh, grandmothers, <laughs> it's really interesting. The next question that is, I'm gonna post it to you as well, that is considering childhood and ados adolescent development in the context of the crisis of care and learning. Do you have comments on the mounting threats of, and damage caused by digital world on children? Can you start with that, Daryl? Yes, yeah. So look, it's funny, digital um, often raises fears for us, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and we think about um, a number of things. So we think about the, um, uh, the, the damage that uh, spending too much time on a, on a device can do in terms of stunting development, you know, that it, that it uh, leads to a lack of creativity, that it takes them away from nature and other um, personal development activities. Um, and there's, a, there's some truth in that. But we also know that devices can be a form of social connection between young people that there's a lot of positive um, educational tools that can be accessed online. Um, lots, of, lots of ways in which they can, can use it for, um, uh, you know, for, for, for connecting, for education um, and for entertainment in positive ways. So um, it doesn't have to be just uh, passive screen time. There can be some very active and, and positive things. So um, the advice that's usually given to parents is don't just have, you know, um, bland restrictions on the amount of time that you have, but rather engage with your children, find out what it is that they're, they're doing. Actually, if they're into gaming, you know, play, get on one of the games with them and play with them so that you're part of their world. Um, the other big concern that parents have, and rightly so, is the issue of online safety, because we know that um, sexual abuse uh, doesn't just happen within families. It doesn't just happen within um, youth serving organisations. It also happens online. And of course, the main reason for that is that we know that grooming, where someone who has the intent of, you know, engaging sexually with a young person uses the opportunity over the internet to be able to kind of build trust, sometimes by pretending to be a, a, a young person. Other times it's just by, you know, offering gifts or, you know, being a, a appearing to be a loving, caring, interesting, you know, older mm -hmm. person. So um, there's a lot of really good resources here in Australia. We have one of the first countries that has an e-safety commissioner um, who's mm -hmm. focused very much on this. Um, and I'll, I'll give the URL to the e-safety commission where there's lots of resources and tips for, 
parents about how to monitor the safety. The biggest thing I would say, though, is you have to start with conversations, um, you know, and to be talking about online safety from sexual abuse, that means giving parents the language to be able to start talking about relationships, to be able to talk about sexual health, normative sexual development, so that a young person will feel comfortable and safe to talk about their concerns. If parents are never, ever talking about this, there is no way that a child is going to say, oh, I saw this rude picture, or someone asked me to do something that I felt uncomfortable about, if their parents haven't already built the environment to say, what you know that it's okay to talk about these things it's not your fault if something you know bad happens on the on the internet so you have to start with those conversations if you ever expect a child to speak up about what might be making them feel uncomfortable but then the third thing uh, that, that i touched on is that it's not just predatory adults a lot of online safety is actually about peer-to-peer, -peer, um, you know, bullying and um, and and, uh, and 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 sexual um, inappropriate behaviour. Okay, thank you, Chamba. Do you have anything? I mean, I, I would guess you have the kind of this global picture of of, the, of this crisis of current learning. Um, in this way, I want to just in, in the last minute that we have, how do you see that kind of this future of education through the digital era. <laughs> I mean, I think I think I think Professor Higgins really uh, summarized it really well. That the, that there is a fear of the digital, and there is a fear of sort of that taking over. I think if you think about it, mobile technology is now mm -hmm. everywhere. I mean, back in my village where I grew up, I go I go home and people do have cell mm -hmm. phones, cell phones. You know, whether it's smart or not, mm -hmm. that's different. So I think. You know, if we think about education more broadly, this this is uh, this is uh, certainly a, a moment of opportunity for us to build back better, um, to to sort of reconceptualize, you know, revisualize what is it that uh, you know that that uh, can help us go the extra mile in getting the most marginalized that were even before COVID, uh, you know, unreached, right? So. Yeah. Uh, so I would say, let us look at the uh, uh, situations. Let us look at the, uh, uh, you know, the modalities through which we can reach them. There, is, there are multiple modalities. I think the recommendation we come with is, let us look at a range of modalities within a country. Mm -hmm. So um, let's, you know, definitely not a one size fits all. Uh, so, so the modality could be online in, in areas uh, where the online access is much better. Mm -hmm. It could be a mobile parenting support group. Uh, you know, like we, we know that in some communities there are WhatsApp groups where parents receive, along with their, did you vaccinate your child? You know, messages about, uh, you know, did you play with your child today? Did, you know, just three minutes. Did you know that, you know, hugging your child for X number of seconds causes their brain to develop? I think like little interventions like that and the bigger interventions where people are feeling supported through their policy environment and through their um, uh, networks is really important. So I would say in answer to that, uh, the, you know, the future of education is bound to change, uh, you know, in this context. Uh, secondly, as we uh, look ahead, uh, you know, at our very young children, uh, our very young children really need a lot of attention because they're foundational, these are foundational skills we're developing at this stage. So we have to look at multiple uh, modalities to support parents to be able to provide that nurturing care to the children. I hope I answered your question. Yeah. Thank you, Chamba. Thank you, Daryl, for all your, your time. I mean, you're in both extremes of the world. I'm actually close, closer to Chamba than Daryl. But thank you for being here. I mean, we have many participants learning from you and from your experience and from your knowledge. I just want to now go to have the break and encourage the participants to contribute to the agreed uh, conclusions, agreed unified statement that we have prepared for today and the last interactive session that just for Daryl and Chimba knowledge is they have prepared something for the last month with many of their group members out of the 95. And, and it's really interesting how they have come up with a unified proposal on child development. So oh, they right. might want, they might, and I, I, they, I think they should uh, change things after listening to you. 
Yeah. So thank you so much for thank being you. here. Thank you. For your time. My pleasure. Thanks um, for everyone's questions and their engagement. It was lovely. Yes. To thank you. Thank you. Okay. Fully, fully encouraged uh, going forward.